باشید
Good morning, Pastor Barry here. Welcome to Griffin Baptist Church. I'm so glad to be with you whenever you're at, wherever you're at. I'm so pleased that the Word of God has found you and laid you captive uh, this day. Um, first of all, let me just say to my church family watching this, I love you guys. Um, uh, I've What a blessing you've been to me over this last year. Uh, I, found, I found these relationships so meaningful. I've found myself going deeper with some of you guys over the last year than I ever dreamed that I would be able to in my first year. Uh, just, I feel like a blessed man a lot of times when I think of all that I've found here at Griffin Baptist Church, and I'm very thankful for you, and I love you very much. Um, this morning, we're going to continue on in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 10 through 12 this morning, verses 10 through 12. Um, 1 Corinthians is a magnificent letter that Paul has written here. I think that it's going to surprise you as we really start getting into it, just how much there is to get out of it. I think you'll find it surprising, edifying, probably convicting at times. And um, we're just going to go through it and deal with the text as God places it in front of us week to week. Um, sometimes if you're doing just sermons topically, kind of off the top of your head in thin air, it's a lot easier to play on emotions and give that really uh, emotional sermon every week. Um, that's not, not what we're doing with this. We're just going verse by verse through the text, week by week through the text. And it might not be a high point every week or a big emotional thing every week, but beloved, there ain't a verse in this whole book that you can't preach from. I had somebody mm -hmm. ask me that uh, recently, and they said, um, but how are you going to preach through every verse in that letter? Aren't there going to be some things that you can't preach on? And I told that person, hey, there's not a book between Genesis, or not a verse between Genesis and, Re and Revelation that will not preach. Every word in God's word is a word that can be preached from. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Let's see what God has for us this morning. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are in the house of Chloe, that there are no contentions among you, now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for calling us before your throne today. Father, we can't understand anything in your word if your spirit doesn't move. We can't live out anything in your word if your spirit doesn't enable us. Father, we've come to you because we see all that we lack. We see all that we need, and we've come to the only place we know to get such things, and that's from you, Lord. We don't want these things just for our own good, but for your glory. Lord, glorify yourself through our lives, through our fellowship together at this church, especially during this time in our world, and in our country right now, Lord. Give us an eternal perspective. Give us a holiness from heaven. Give us a love like you sh have shown us at the cross. Father, forgive us of our many sins. Cause us to walk in a more stable fashion. Father, thank you for all the great gifts that you've given me and all the rest of your children this week and even on this day. Thank you for the sun to shine upon our faces yet another day to bring you glory and to even hear your word. Let us not take it for granted, Lord. Show us these things in light of eternity. Father, hide me behind the cross. Allow me to preach your word truthfully. And if there's any error, Lord, as always, please just erase it away and don't let it take root, but only that which is true, Lord. And let those things take root, and then let those things bear fruit in the lives of your believers, as you've prophesied that it should. 
I ask all these things, Lord, in your most holy name. Amen. So today, we're going to continue on in Paul's letter to Corinth. Now that we've made it through the greetings and the thanks, we're going to be diving really into the meat of Paul's letter for the next few weeks. I'm very excited about doing this. While most of Paul's other letters really focuses heavy on doctrine, this letter focuses heavy on the church. And, but you're going to see that he corrects the church by way of doctrine interwoven throughout the entire le letter. Right off in our text this morning, immediately, Paul deals with divisions within the body of the church. Our culture thrives on disunity and division. North, south, black, white, city, country, red, blue. Our media enjoys such divisions. Our politicians enjoy such divisions. You know, it's even been said that a, a government can do more if one party doesn't control every faction of it, but that other factions are controlled by the other party. And then a lot of the country is happier about that as well because it'll send the government into a lockdown and the government does nothing. And a lot of people like it when the government do nothing. Um, campaigns like it when things are split because... Well, if, if Joe Biden controls the House and the Senate and everything, he has to make good on his campaign promises, doesn't he? If he doesn't, then he's got a sca scapegoat way out. Well, I, don't con I didn't control the Senate during my time, so I couldn't do that. Divisions serve these purposes in our country. In our country and in our culture, controversy is good for business. Our news channels have turned more into TMZ than they have really anything to do with the news. And we have our gossip columns and our gossip magazines and our social media gossip. However, and listen, however, what works for the country and cable is disastrous for the church. Politics may thrive on debates. Churches are boarded up by debate. Cable may thrive on controversy. Churches are closed on controversy. What works for the world is not good for the ones of the word. In church, we should be different. We should conduct ourselves in unity. Paul's made this very clear at the beginning of this letter. Unity in love, unity in doctrine, unity in leadership, unity in language, unity in fellowship, unity in obedience. Notice Paul begins the letter dealing with divisions. And why? Because divisions will always steal the power of God in a church. Every time. It is, it is a fabric sewn in of the evil one. It is not of God. Factions are fatal. Divisions are deadly. So, then, they should be put to death. I have a simple sermon for you this morning just based on the truth of the scripture here. We're going to delve into it. We're going to look at some of the words, what they mean. We're going to look at some of the names, who they are. We're going to delve, kind of dive into this division, contrast it at the same time in our own time, and then have three applications. So it's a two-point sermon with a simple three-point application, if you're taking notes. And so first, I want you to see this issue. There's this issue of pleading, this plea issue. You see that in verse 10. Notice, Paul doesn't command, does he? He beseeches. He urges. He pleads. He exhorts. The word in Greek here literally means to come alongside. It means to walk side by side. It literally means to walk step by step with another person together in unity. Paul could have commanded. This is the Apostle Paul, after all. He's an apostle. He's a preacher. He's a, he's a pastor, even at times, a spiritual father. But these believers at this church are some, some of them young, most all of them spiritually immature, and they wouldn't be able to take that sort of harshness in his language. So he's sensitive to them. He calls them, notice in, in verse 10, he calls them brethren. In other words, he's not questioning their salvation. 
you know, one of the interesting things we're going to see as you go through this letter, that there's a very interesting uh, spiritual and I guess uh, somewhat philosophical question in our faith, which is how carnal can a person be and still be a Christian? Um, Corinth will surprise you by that answer. And so even here, you see, he's calling them brethren. He's not questioning their salvation. And notice even in Paul's appeal, in his plea, and in his, his appeal in verse 10, he's not pleading on behalf of himself, is he? He's not going, I'm an apostle, I am the apostle Paul, you do not know who I am, I have seen the risen Lord, I was trying to kill Christians, he converted me, I've seen him risen from the dead, this is who I am, you should listen to me. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, beloved, I came to you, I left my home and my family, I came to you way out, so far away from my homeland, spent 18 months with you, lived in the street at times, had to live on the generosity of others, had no possessions really to call my own, and struggled and strived and birthed you out of a, a yard of hell, which was a pagan, just port city of prostitution and debauchery. I lived there for 18 months. Please listen to me. He doesn't do any of that, does he? What is his appeal? What is he appealing on behalf of? The name Jesus Christ, whom he calls our Lord. This is the appeal. This is, this is, this is on behalf of what? Of who? On Jesus. If somebody is not going to do it, for the name of Jesus. They're definitely not going to do it on behalf of your name. If they're not going to do it based upon what Christ has done, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've been somewhere 18 months or 20 months. It doesn't matter if you've been in college one day or 20 years. If They won't do it for the Lord and for the work that He's done. They'll never do it for you in whatever work you've done. It's only logical to even appeal on behalf of the Lord because there is nothing more superior than that. And like Paul says, He is our Lord. So this is not just some friend we're appealing on behalf of, but somebody who rules over us with authority to speak on such matters, to call us into submission. Paul's right about that. There's no one more worthy. Paul urges for them to agree in what they say. You see that? To agree literally means to speak the same, uh, to confess the same thing. That's what it means in the original language. Now let me kind of explain this for you because... Um, our culture really is confused about this. You know, we're to confess our sins. There's still so much Catholicism within Protestantism at times. When we go to confess our sins, it just becomes, um, thou shalt not lie. I told a lie. I go to God in my prayer life and say, okay, God, I lied. Forgive me. To confess our sins is, is much more deep than that. Because it, it, it means... To agree. It means to speak the same. These words all are the same thing. So when Paul says to agree, he means to speak the same, to confess the same. The same, the same word we see when we're to confess our sins, right? So instead of that, that real just dead ritual with no emotion or spirit behind it, I lied, forgive me, we're to speak the same. We go to God in our prayer life and we go to him and say, Lord, your word says thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. I've done that. That's wrong of me to do that, Lord. I'm speaking the same as your word. Your word says this. I say that too. Your word says to come and confess and there'll be forgiveness, Lord. I've come. I'm speaking the same thing as, as your word speaks. I'm in agreement. I agree that is wrong. Please forgive me. There's so many people that just deadly confess things just with dead spirits and souls off their tongue, they don't even agree with it. Lord, I, I did this, forgive me. They, they don't actually think it's wrong. They just know what it says, but there hasn't been any real heart change that they're really even speaking the same thing in agreement in confession. It's all about speaking the same thing. Listen, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, in a church context, how do we do this? How can you put 100 people and get them all to speak the same thing? Let me tell you. We, just like the person in confession... We speak what God's Word says. We confess this truth. If we all speak this, we all speak the same thing. You see that? 
How can a church be united through COVID? We can all speak the same thing. How can a church be united in a politically divisive climate? We can all speak the same thing. Scripture speaks to almost every aspect of life. Politically, uh, emotionally, your home life, uh, everything. There, there's not an area that Scripture doesn't speak on. You know, I saw this thing when I was a kid one time. It was kind of a, a, like an acronym for Bible, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, which is a very good acronym, I think. And it is very much basic instructions while living here upon the earth. How are we to, to treat our president? If you're a Republican, how are you supposed to feel about Biden? You don't have to agree with what he does. But pray for the man. Pray. We can speak the same thing on that. We can pray the same prayer on that. We can do these things. We're not going to be able to speak the same thing if we're not speaking from the word, though, beloved. Listen. The book of first opinions is a recipe for divisions. There is no book of first opinions in Scripture. If you bring that into the church, you're going to create divisions. We don't thrive on opinion. We thrive on the Word of God. Divisions, Paul says, and this is a Greek word that literally means, we get the word schism from it. A schism. It, it means to rip apart, to tear, or to withdraw. Paul desires them to be perfectly joined. You can see that in the text. Your, trans your translation may say complete. This word is not like our English word. Um, you, you see that later on in Scripture when Jesus is, is speaking and he says to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect or to be complete like your heavenly Father is complete depending on your translation. And there are groups of Christians that take that and say, oh, I can live without sin because Jesus says to be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. So I'm just, and it's called Christian perfectionism. And they run around, they think that they don't sin, and they have no sin, they have nothing to confess. This is not what that word means in the original language. It's far more deep, and it's far more beautiful. It means to mend something that has been broken. It's used in, the, in this time, in this language, in this culture, when someone breaks a bone, and a bone has to be set. It's used regarding mending torn fishing nets together, or sewing back fabric that had been torn and sewing it back together tightly. Together means in the same mind, uh, means that we see things the same way. How can this happen except through Scripture? It can't. Every church needs a prescription. This church and every other church needs a prescription for a set of eyeglasses. And I know what some of you are thinking, that's easy for you to say, Barry, you don't even wear glasses. And I plan on not wearing them as long as I can. But every church needs a prescription for a pair of eyeglasses that will, that will give them a lens of the Word. We need to see the world through the lens of the Word. This is a real problem in the American church. Notice he says, mind and judgment. In other words, we need one opinion and we need one mind. This underpins our unity. You know, when I was a teenager and I was learning how to drive, I really hated driving with one foot for some reason. And my mom would take me around and let me drive the car. And one day, we were driving down 123, and we kind of lived right off of 123, right before you get to Clemson, um, near where they got the food line and stuff now. And I went to take a left off 123, and you know, there's two other lanes on the other side, and I was going to get in the median and stop, and then cross when it was safe. But driving with two feet, I hit the brake and the gas at the same time, which the car made an awful squealing sound with the tires, and we didn't stop, and we didn't necessarily speed up, but we were kind of drifting sideways, Went sideways through the middle. My mom was grabbing the wheel. I was grabbing the wheel. Thank goodness we didn't get hurt. But beloved, listen. If we're not of the same mind and the same judgment of one opinion, that's exactly what it's like. You're going to have one mind and one judgment, both running a pedal and then people fighting over a steering wheel. And the car is going to wreck. The church will wreck. We have to be of one. You drive that car with one foot. Not two feet on one on each pedal. Of one mind, of one judgment, these things work together harmoniously. 
This is not some one-off that Paul's doing here in 1 Corinthians. Paul speaks on this unity throughout his letters. In Romans chapter 12, verse 16, he says, Be of the same mind toward one another. He speaks on it more in Romans 15, 5. In Philippians 2, 2, he speaks on it. In Ephesians 4, 3, he even says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He's constantly urging the churches that he's writing to to keep this unity. So maybe you've noticed, as I've noticed during the pandemic, um, unity is a, a sparse commodity in the American church right now. At this church and at every church, I speak to pastors all over this state and all over this country, all over the world, in fact. I talk to other pastors on a weekly basis and this is a common theme. Unity is hurting in the church. Division is running rampant in the churches. It's not new. These are some of the first churches ever that Paul's writing the letters to. And you see the same struggle and you see the same goal being set. We need unity. We don't create unity. That's why it's so difficult. If, if there was a magic recipe and I could just do this or that and we could have perfect unity, oh, I'd do it. I would do it, but we don't create it. We preserve it and maintain it, but Christ creates unity. This is why he pleads on behalf of Christ for the unity amongst the divisions. The church is only as strong as our weakest believer. The immature within a body of believers will always sacrifice unity and harmony. Harmony for the book of first opinions, and for their personal preferences. One fly in the ointment will spoil all the ointment. One person can ruin it all. Let me show you the second thing that Paul is pointing out here in our text this morning. You see a problem identified. So you see a plea, and you see a problem the problem identified, you see that verses 11 through 12. Paul is in Ephesus when he's writing this letter, and he hears of this division from Chloe. We don't really know who Chloe is. Uh, definitely a prominent person in Corinth. There's some debate over whether Chloe is a man or a woman. I would side that it's probably a man because the text says the house of Chloe, and because this was a patriarchal society, um, it would have been the house of the it would have been the man's house. So it would have been. That would make more sense given the patriarchy nature of the biblical society. This church's problems are serious. This is serious. This is not just some minor quibble going on. This is a serious problem. These are real deep rivalries and dissensions and, and factions within the church. These are hot button issues. Corinth, you, you think whatever church you're thinking of as a fighting church in your head was a real fighting church? No, this church is a professional fighting church. This church is the MMA of churches. These fights are stemming from things we would never even think a fight stemming from. Baptism rivalries, church figure rivalries, desiring prominence and status through these things. It's all ego underneath it. There are four groups. I want to look at each of these groups very briefly. First, I am of Paul. These members are the charter members. These have been at this church longer than anybody. They were there when the church was planted. And so they think themselves to have seniority because they've been there longer than anybody else. They have a strong bond with one another. They grew up in the church together. They were birthed in adversity in pagan Corinth even by Christ through Paul. So their loyalty is to Paul. Paul's not perfect. That's part of the problem with this division. While Paul, I think, like many other theologians, was the model Christian in many regards, he is not a perfect man. And he certainly was not a perfect minister. Scripture says he had an unimpressive style of speaking. He lacks oratory skills. He's not good at talking. It would be so that people were shocked when they met Paul. If he sent a letter first and then he showed up later, they'd say, you're the Paul that wrote that writes this way? It, his writing 
to this culture did not match his speaking abilities. He lacked oratory skills. He also had an unimpressive appearance, and it's said that he had a small stature. So he's a little short man who couldn't speak well and didn't look very nice. Then you have Apollos. You see the I am of Apollos group. This is the second generation of the church. This is the other group that has joined under Apollos. So there was a group when Paul planted the church, and then there's the group that came, don't know Paul, they, they showed up under Apollos. He had a different personality than Paul. He's from Alexandria, Egypt even. You can see this in Acts chapter 18 that we're told something of him. And in Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt was the biggest library of the ancient world. It was actually even the first Christian library. So this, he comes from the hub of Christian intellectualism even for the first five centuries of the church. He, he comes with a good resume. And so these people are loyal to Apollos. He does speak well. He does look good. He is very suave in his style and his delivery. Paul, though, is doctrinal and blunt, contrasting different styles, different people. And guess what? Paul's point here is not that that's not okay. Paul's point here is that that is fine. He even goes on later to commend Apollos uh, for for being part of the growth at the church. He never condemns this man for being different. And Apollos, we would never have any accounts of him condemning Paul for Paul being the way that he is. In ministry, you see this a lot. And even us here at Griffin, this is kind of where we're at in our walk right now. Because I'm a new pastor here. I, I'm within my first year here still. And I hear, well, Terry did this. Well, Terry did that. Well, Terry was this way. Mark was this way. Mark did this. Mark did that. God bless those men and their service here to this church for our Lord Jesus. But at the same time, like Paul or Apollos, I am not the other man. I am me, and I do things the way that I do things, and the way that my personality is. Everybody's personality is different. Everybody's personality, if you're a Christian, is being shaped by God in some way. Um, I tried to tell that to somebody in church. This church I was working at one time, and I tried to explain my past and why I am the way I am because of the war, uh, growing up in an abusive household. I, I have baggage. I have emotional baggage that I carry with me. And some people are very dismiss dismissive about that. And they go, well, that's not fair. Well, it might not be fair, but that's life. And that's how human beings are. We all have baggage. We all have a past. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for being silent. Uh, some pastors are really talkative. My granddad is the sort of pastor that tells, I mean, he's got a joke for every day of the week. Uh, he could show up a Sunday, every Sunday for a year and not tell the same joke twice and it, every one of those be funny. Some pastors have tons of stories. Um, some pastors like me or Paul, we're, we're just more doctrinal. We're just more stuck in the word and that's what we want to do. Um, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Um, we got to love each other for, for who people are that God's shaped them to be, I think. Um, you hear a lot, our culture is very cliquish, and we're very much about popularity. If you're a new pastor and you go into a church nowadays, you'll come, commonly hear things like, well, we like you, or my kids like you, or my spouse likes you. If we were politicians, I'm sure we'd love that, but being pastors and preachers, uh, akin to prophets even at times, because we speak as the Word of God, we're, we're not hyper-concerned with being liked. We're hyper-concerned with being biblical. And I'm not so sure that the church should be teaching people in that fashion that, well, we'll, we'll be good to this pastor as long as we like him. Um, never does God ever say anything about what you like. Um, it, it's oftentimes doing things in spite of what you like. It's oftentimes praying for your leaders in spite of how you feel about them or obeying your government despite how you feel about them or coming under the authority of your pastor, your elder at your church, despite how you feel. It's not about what you like. This is Paul's point. Look at this next name here. He, this kind of breaks the four and a half. This is now Cephas. This is Aramaic for Peter. Uh, many theologians say this is the Apostle Peter, and so he would have been sort of an itinerant preacher coming to Corinth as a visitor, uh, just speaking as a guest speaker. 
these people that are chasing that status. You got people that, well, the Apostle Paul is our guy. Well, Paulus is our guy. He's smart and suave. Paul can't talk for a hill of beans. Oh, yeah? Well, my guy is Peter. My guy is the head of the apostles and the head of the church in Jerusalem. This is all immature. And see, you might be thinking, but he's a, he's a guest speaker. Surely there, there'd be more pull from their actual minister, wouldn't there? No. A guest speaker holds a certain sway over groups of people. Um, they say an expert is anyone 25 miles away or further with a, a briefcase. Because, see, this person doesn't live with you. you. You don't get to see their imperfections, do you? You don't really get to know them well. Uh, you don't really get to see him or talk to him outside of outside of a little pulpit. There's no weakness to know of. There's no sin to forgive. There's nothing not to like. And you see this last group. This is this is the climax. This is the worst group of all. And you're saying, yeah, but it says in Christ is put in a list of four negative groups, negative fractions within the church. This is not spoken of positively. Paul will go on from here and talk about, is Christ divided among you even? This is not a good group. They are misusing this like people do in our culture. This last group, those of Christ, this is the climax of negative divisions. This is the worst faction of all within the church. This is the most arrogant. They don't need a human teacher. They don't need a pastor's teaching. They don't need accountability from their church leadership. They don't need to submit to the authority of the church. They're at the church to do their own thing, their own way. All four of these factions still exist within the church today, and this last faction I've found more frequently than others. Uh, the faction of Peter, you see that within the church today because Peter would have been a heavy emphasizer of the Jewishness of the gospel. And that's starting to pick up in the American church today. Whereas if you're a pastor, you see people coming to you and they say, well, why don't we observe the Sabbath on Friday night? How come we're not doing that? Um, how come we're eating pork at our, at our little meals in the fellowship hall? I thought the Bible says this, but we shouldn't eat that. Um, how come we don't cover our head with yarmulkes? You know, there's this Jewish movement within the church today that's given to that. Um, that would have appealed to Cephas. There, there's also a movement of eloquence of speech. Uh, there's a movement like Paul's that well, we don't want a good speaker. We just want a simpleton. We want that rule wisdom. And so you see all of this within the church today, even this last group. Oh, we don't need a preacher. We don't need a teacher. We don't need biblical accountability. We don't need our elder to exercise authority over us. We just do what we like and we follow people that we like. Uh, all of this still exists today. There's three applications to this text in closing. First, we need to join the local church. You need to come under a Peter, a Paul, an Apollos. Listen, we're equal in dignity and in value in the church, but we are not equal in roles within the church. This is going to become abundantly clear to you as we go on through Scripture. There are roles for women in a church, and there's roles for men in a church, um, there's roles for lay people in a church. There's roles for the elder or the pastor in the church. There's roles for the deacons in the church. Uh, these roles are not all equal. We are all equal in dignity and value, but not in roles. This, this sort of system that God has set up is what keeps everything balanced and keeps everything level. You should be under a pastor, an elder in your church. Two, my second point, you see from this, you need to follow your spiritual leaders. That's Paul's point. He's saying, quit the divisions. The spiritual leader there, follow the man. Quit this, I'm of Christ, not of him. I'm of the traveling itinerant preacher, not the guy who's here every week. I'm of the guy before, but not the guy here now. Follow your spiritual leaders. I've had people come to me at my time, especially pastoring my last church, and they'd come to me and uh, they, church hopping. And I'd say, why did you leave your last church? We didn't like that pastor. Well, what did he do? Did, did he sin? Was he, is he un, unfit for the role? No, we just didn't like him. 
Beloved, you, you need to go back to that church. You need to get back under your elder. That's the elder God's given you. That's the body you've joined and committed to. That's the family you've dedicated yourself to. You need to go back and reconcile that and just learn to live with the things you don't like to be obedient to the Word of God. We need to follow our spiritual leaders. We need to emulate and imitate them. Now, you're saying, well, that's a very arrogant thing for you to say, Barry. 1 Corinthians 11 1 makes that clear. Even Paul commands that. We understand as elders when we say that how big of a statement that is. It's an immense amount of pressure. But we want you to follow us and obey us as we follow Christ and obey Christ. We want you to emulate us as we emulate Christ. That's what we want. We realize we're not perfect. We realize we make mistakes. So do you. And we're going to give you grace. And we're going to show you grace when you do. And you show the same grace back that we've shown you. Emulate. Imitate. As we emulate and imitate God. We follow our leaders as they follow the word. We should never, ever harm the ministers that the Lord has given us. And we follow them. We follow them. We don't run ahead of them. We don't run off another direction from them. We're not trying to get into debates and argue to get our own way. We follow the leaders that God has given us. And third, maybe most importantly, we keep our eyes upon Jesus. You don't want to get so enamored in point number two there of your application that you forget it's all about following Jesus. You don't want to become some man-centered cult. Um, you don't want it to be all about following a pastor and you forget about who you're really there to follow. You're, you're there to follow the Lord. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the one that's died for us. He's the one that's lived for us. He's the one that's called us into salvation. He's the one coming back to collect us on the last day. He's the one who we're going to spend eternity with. He's the one who's all in all. He is the one our eyes should be fixed upon. The word preached is enough then. Praise sung is enough then. Grumblings must cease with divisions. They must cease. The church exists for these reasons. Praise, prayer, preaching. You say, well, what about abortion ministries and hunger ministries and coat drive ministries? That's called the social gospel. I've got nothing against those things. But those things are the roles of individual Christians. As a Christian, yeah, go out and fight abortion. Speak against abortion. Feed the hungry. Clothe the cold. Visit people in prison. But the role of the church as an organization is the focus of Christ, His Word, prayer, preaching, and singing. That's the focus. That's essential. Everything else could fade, and if you have those things, you still have all the essentials of what makes church, church. And praise God we've been able to keep those things through even a pandemic. Christ is the focus. Christ is our same mind, His Word, our common tongue, and His love, our uniting kinship. We need to die to divisions. Beloved, division is a sin as serious as any other. You can't look at Scripture and want to stone a homosexual and then be somebody pushing divisions. Don't just nitpick your sins. We need to take all sins seriously. We need... To be like the word means and be speak the same thing. Be of the same mind on these things. If we can see that, we can repent of that. Let's be marked by unity, especially in a time of such division. And then let's let that unity shine. That's what will stick out in 2021, believe me. Division, that's going to blend in with all the rest of the division. But unity will shine. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for letting us see it and understand it. Father, thank you for preserving it and giving it to us, even for a time such as this. Father, we desire unity, unity in our homes, unity in our church, unity in all of our relationships and all of our fellowship, Lord. Kill all of the divisions. Silence all of the tongues that would sow the devil's thread. 
Father, rip that asunder and mend the broken bones. Set them straight. Weep together what was broken. You're the great mender, Lord. We know that you can do this work. We know that you're the one that gives unity, that everything is in you. We've been called in you. We're saved in you. Our identity is in you. Our whole being is in you. Our future is wrapped up in you. And even the present moment is being held together by you, Lord. Our unity is in you. Magnify yourself more, Lord, that we may be united even stronger in the bond of love in you. And we ask these things in your holy name. Amen.